My journey begins with a plane flight from the capital Khartoum across a vast desert to Nyella in South Darfur. It's a dusty regional centre full of bumpy, unpaved roads. Nyela is surrounded by camps, which hold a quarter of a million displaced people. We're on our way to Otash camp, home to an estimated 57,000. It appears out of the desert. The conditions are just pitiful. It's rare to see someone with a camera here, and people are eager to show me their awful situation. Everywhere you go in Baghdad these days, you see children begging, children working, children who should be in school. There are thousands of kids, like Murtaba in Baghdad, children who have become adults before their time. Before the war, Iraq had an education system and social services to protect the vulnerable. Now, there is almost nothing provided by the state. As a result, the children I met live on their wits or rely on charity, the charity of the militias. I went to a children's home in Sadr City, the Kapul al Yatim, funded by Muqtada Sadr's militia. They look after 700 orphans here. Most of them were orphaned by the war. It's a good orphanage. The children are clean, well fed, and well indoctrinated by the Mullah's propaganda. PNG is just a few kilometers off the Australian coast, but the two countries are worlds apart. Despite the hundreds of millions of aid dollars spent here, common preventable illnesses claim too many lives. None are more vulnerable than PNG's young. For every 1,000 babies born here, more than 70 will die before their fifth birthday. That's a mortality rate 14 times higher than in Australia. I say it constantly, that the most valuable resource of Papua New Guinea is the children. This is Port Moresby's one and only morgue. The building can house 60, yet it's always overcrowded. The abandoned bodies of babies are piling up. You will see that some of the name tags have got unknown mother, and these could be children that were actually found outside somewhere in the suburb, 
and brought into our A&E dead on arrival room without any identification. So. Social worker Tessie Soy and her volunteers have arrived to make some room at the morgue. Now these infants will have some dignity in death. Today, 24 of them will be buried in a mass funeral. Okay, these ones are actually twins, so they're, they're, they're triplets, but one has survived. These two have unfortunately not. So make sure that they're put together in the grave. Some of these bodies have been here for months. Maybe of unknown mother. In many cases, mothers died giving birth. Other parents simply can't afford to pay the funeral costs. Baby of Alice Jackson. Tessie Soy's final gesture is to give the babies a name before their burial. And this is young Bradley and this is young Rarua. Where you're going, it's nice that you should have a name and, and uh, my identity. So God bless my babies. I'll go and put you to rest at nine months. <laughs> Burkina Faso, in West Africa. On the northern road out of the capital Ugudugu, in the direction of Jibo, you come across one of the last remaining luxurious colonial estates. However, beyond this, the Sahara Desert is penetrating ever further into the land. What was formerly fertile countryside is rapidly becoming semi-desert. Over the last few years, rainfall during the rainy season has been negligible leaving the ground vulnerable to wind erosion and overgrazing. Swiss aid organisation, New Tree, wants to put a stop to this vicious circle. A small-scale venture aimed at fencing in small, manageable areas has been set up. New Tree supplies the raw materials, while the villagers themselves see to the platting and erecting of the fences, like here in Pobo Mengal. Using this method, more than 100 hectares of Burkina Faso's wasteland has been fenced in, with the same success in neighbouring Benin. Since the fencing, 120,000 trees have been sprouted and are now thriving. The project was conceived by Swiss doctor Felix Kirchler. After years working for medical development aid, he wanted to make a more permanent contribution to the people of Burkina Faso as well as to help protect the climate. I have a vision in which this wasteland, covering millions of hectares, becomes green again. It was green hundreds of years ago. A variety of trees and bushes flourished in the savannah, providing food and sustenance to man and beast, natural health remedies, shelter, protection, agroforestry. Even millet and maize can be cultivated here. It all did happen once. This was the reality here. A labyrinth of lanes reveal the Borgo's medieval past, but it's a very different place to when Michelangelo and other great artists were here at the turn of the 15th century and the flowering of the Renaissance age. Now there are more artisans than artists, like furniture maker Massimo Caccianotta. But memories of the past endure. He's a great admirer of the nude, but he's never heard of Michelangelo's naked Christ. Michelangelo was drawn to Rome by one of the world's greatest building projects, the rebuilding of St. Peter's Basilica. The artist and architect was a papal favourite. The square where Pope Benedict XVI receives pilgrims was then a work in progress. 
Michelangelo stored huge lumps of marble for his sculptures here. Scholars believe he used one of them to make the missing naked Christ.